Good morning and welcome to worship this morning, whether you're worshiping here or at home. Uh, don't really have much in the way of announcements this morning and there was nothing written on the joys and concerns sheet, so um, just hope that everyone is um, getting through this time well and uh, we'll be glad to see everybody again once we get the all clear to begin meeting again in person. Uh, rather than having the regular praise course this morning, we're going to have a, a special uh, feature uh, of a song that was written especially for mothers, so a Mother's Day video this morning. Isn't she she Continue with uh, preparing our hearts, <clears throat> hearts for worship with the sanctuary. So, folks, want to come up? Go ahead and come up. be in an attitude of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks that whatever happens in life, we know that you are there with us. We come to you in a time that has been difficult for so many. Um, fears, frustrations, whether they be for our health and safety or whether they be for the economy and our personal finances. So much loss in the country of life. So many people that are battling the virus on front lines and are weary in need of rest. 
but yet you are in the midst of that and we give you thanks for all of those that are hurting, for all of those that are grieving, for all of those that are fearful. We lift them up to you and the power of your love and your grace and your peace. God, you have directed us to be instruments of your love, to love with the same love that you loved. And so we ask that you empower us to do that, to find places where there are need, to find people that are hurting, to do what we can to be Christ to them in this situation. Lord, as we worship you today, help us to find some new word of hope in your scripture, to find some new purpose for our lives in what you would have us do and be. It is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we've been um, using a sermon series put out by the Church of the Resurrection uh, with much of the material by Adam Hamilton uh, these past couple of weeks. And we started, um, we're looking for hope Today it'll be looking for hope in the Gospels. In the first week we had a couple of definitions of hope. And I want to go back to the one that is the uh, verb definition of hope, which is choosing to believe and act as if the future will be better than the present. Of course, the opposite of hope would be despair. And if you were to have a definition of that, it would be choosing to believe and act as if the future will be as bad or if not worse than the present. And the question that uh, we need to ask ourselves is, which are we uh, going to choose, hope or despair? Um, hope is a feeling, but often feelings come from our thoughts that we allow to go through our heads, from what we tell ourselves. Um, whatever you tell yourself, you often come to believe. And so we look to the Bible to see if we can make that choice always be hope. Uh, we've searched the Psalms and the prophets for hope. Um, Adam Hamilton in his sermon said that um, to find the references that he has been using, he went to a, a concordance of the Bible and just typed in hope in the Psalms and hope in the prophets and uh, many, many verses came up. But then he said he typed in hope uh, and searched the Gospels and said he asked how many times do you suppose the word hope is found in the four Gospels? Well, surprisingly, only once. Uh, that's if you look at the King James, possibly two or three, if you look at some of the uh, more current uh, translations. And he said he asked himself why, if hope is absolutely central to our faith, doesn't Jesus talk about hope? And the answer that he came up with was that it is because Jesus, in everything he said and everything he did and the way he lived, embodied and incarnated hope. And so people found hope in him through his ministry and not necessarily by him using those words. Jesus gives hope to others by what he says, by what he does, by how he heals and reaches out and touches people. If you'll remember the past couple of weeks, we've used um, the words orientation, disorientation, and reorientation uh, to talk about stages of our life. Orientation is when things are going well. Disorientation is when they kind of feel like they're falling apart and we've kind of lost our way. Uh, now would be a, a time of disorientation for most of us. And then reorientation is when you've kind of moved through that and began to put your life back together again. Um, the Psalms are written from all three perspectives. 
The prophets are written primarily in a time of disorientation, giving hope to those that are going through bad times, that there is hope that one day there will be reorientation. The gospel, um, we find that in all four of the gospels, the account of Jesus, that usually Jesus is living, uh, is working with people who are in a time of disorientation, seeking them to bring them back to God and back to reorientation. Uh, We're going to be using a little bit different terms this time, uh, order, disorder, and reorder. Um, Basically meaning the same things, but just a little bit different way of putting those. We're going to look at how Jesus takes people whose lives are in disorder and what Jesus does to bring them back into a reordered life. We're going to look at uh, several different kinds of um, disorders, uh, reasons for being uh, living a disordered life. And the, the first category of people and the ones that people that uh, Jesus often found himself drawn, himself drawn to are people that were living disordered lives because of their own actions. Um, sometimes our lives get out of kilter. We lose track of our values. We make bad dis- choices and decisions. Uh, We allow ourselves to become far away from God. Um, Jesus was clear about um, what makes an ordered life. Uh, He said there were two great commandments. The first was to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And he said the second was like it, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. We're living an ordered life when we live out of those two commandments. But it's also keeping things in uh, perspective, in priority, um, to have a well-ordered life, pleasing to God. God has to be the center of that, that prime uh, commandment to love God with all our mind and strength and soul and strength and uh, self. Um, If that's at the core and God is at the center of our lives, and then after that we worry about the welfare of others and loving others as Christ loved them, and then um, think about ourselves and our needs, then our life is ordered and pleasing to God. Um, But sometimes, uh, especially in today's society, we start thinking it's all about me. Me, me, my hopes, my dreams. uh, It's all centered around us. Everything else tries to be built around that, and we find that we're... um, we've lost touch with the important things in life. When our priorities are messed up, Um, our lives become disordered. Jesus came to that kind of people, people who had made uh, mistakes, who had blown it, who had focused on themselves instead of focusing on God. Uh, The Gospels tell us that Jesus spent most of his time with a category of people that were kind of despised, tax collectors and sinners, people who had made mistakes. They drifted from God. They had done things they were ashamed of, Maybe they felt like they were no longer welcome in God's house. It may have been people who were overwhelmed by shame and guilt. And Jesus came looking for those people. He embodied hope. He offered hope to people who themselves and everyone else thought were hopeless beyond God's love and care. Sixty times in the gospel, Jesus talks about forgiveness. Over and over again, he offers forgiveness Instead of condemnation, he offers grace. Jesus' message to these people is God still wants you. God knows every creepy, cruddy thing you've ever done, and he still wants you. He still loves you. Welcome back. Come home. And so he told stories like the story of the prodigal son where he talked about people who were sinners who were welcomed back home. And he loves and welcomes those who've been broken an example of his own followers and disciples, um, the calling of Matthew. Um, It says, Jesus saw a man named Matthew sitting at a kiosk for collecting taxes. He said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Now, Matthew meant gift from God. So someone, when Matthew was born, thought that he was a gift from God and gave him that name. But he'd fallen away from that. Tax collectors were notoriously dishonest. They were focused on money. They were basically working for the enemy, making their money off of how much uh, beyond the required taxes they could eke out of people and keep from themselves. 
who was Jesus to call someone like that? It says, as Jesus sat down to eat in Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners joined Jesus and his disciples at the table. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? In other words, why on earth would Jesus spend time with people like that? That is so not okay. Jesus' reply was, when Jesus heard it, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. I didn't come to call righteous people, but sinners. Jesus said he came to seek and save those who were lost. He looked for those that were broken, messed up, whose lives were disordered. A reminder of what Jesus said to those people, come to me, all that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens. Some scriptures say weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what Jesus says to us today. We carry heavy burdens. There's part of our lives that are disordered. And he says to us, come to me, all that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens. I will give you rest. That's what he said to the sinners and broken people whose lives had fallen apart, whose lives, lives were in disarray, were disordered. Adam Hamilton <clears throat> talked about somebody who had written <clears throat> a book saying that we ought to put in um, special scanners at church like they have in the airport, only um, these scanners would be able to see <clears throat> what was inside people's hearts as they came to church. And that then we would be able to see that every single one of us is broken, disordered in some way. Jesus says to us, I can reorder your life if you let me. It can be better than it's been in the past. Because God is a God of second chances. It doesn't matter what you've done. He loves you. He wants you. He can restore and reorder you. That's what he said to the people he encountered while he was here on earth, and that's what he still says to each of us. Second kind of disorder uh, we're going to talk about is anxiety and fear about what's going on in the world around us. This is a time of high anxiety, great disorder and disorientation for people. We have the p pandemic and bringing with it economic disaster, death toll rising, people out of work. We're naturally anxious about all of that. Jesus was speaking in a time of great anxiety too. Roman soldiers were all around. People were struggling to feed themselves. There were sicknesses of all kinds. In the midst of that, Jesus had the audacity to say, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of living? Now, we might look at that and think, oh, come on, Jesus, we're just not supposed to worry. It's that simple. Just don't worry. Be happy. We all know that telling ourselves not to worry won't make us not worry. But Jesus' answer would be, look, you've got to trust me. You've got to trust God. You've got to trust that God is with you, that God's got a hold of you, that he's going to take care of you. Look, if your father knows what you need before you even ask, then he's, he's got this. So if your life is ordered and you're putting your trust in him, God will take care of you. And you might say, oh, come on, how does that work? Uh, we just have magic food or money that falls out of the sky to meet our needs. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. How it works is that Jesus calls his disciples to care for other people. He cared for people while he was on this earth. He fed the multitude with a few fish and loaves of bread. He took care of people, and then he said, okay, now the things that I do, you're supposed to go do. He calls us to be his instruments, to be his hands and feet, to represent him in the world. He said in Matthew 25, when you see people hungry, you're supposed to feed them. If you see them thirsty or naked or in prison or sick or a stranger, you're supposed to help them. That's why we do some of the things that we do in this church 
the meal ministry, people donating to Atlas, the youth growing on ministry trips. We do all of those things to represent Jesus to the world, to be the hands and feet of Jesus to others, to give them hope in a time when their world is disordered. Adam Hamilton uh, preaches out of the Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas, in the Kansas City area, and he was talking about one of the efforts uh, in their neighborhood of um, teachers that were delivering boxes of food that had been donated to some of their students that they knew might be in need. And he told about a family where uh, the parents were away from home working, and so the 10-year-old uh, was responsible for caring for the 4-year-old, and the teacher went to their home to drop off uh, a box of things, and uh, the kids looked through the box and found a, a, a box of chocolate pudding and wanted to know what that was. And she said, you've never seen, you've never tried chocolate pudding before? And they said, no, they'd never had that. And so the teacher um, stayed and made pudding with the two children and ate it with them. God uses us, God sends us to be instruments of hope. Jesus says, come to me all that are weary and are heavy laden, carrying heavy burdens, I will give you rest. For that family, there was once order, then the coronavirus brought disorder, then people contributing, coming to help, staying to make pudding, reorders their lives and brings hope. Well, the last category of people who are broken are people who are physically, relationally, emotionally um, broken. Jesus spends most of his time, as I said, with broken people, and so many of the accounts in the Bible are of Jesus healing that brokenness, physical, emotional, spiritual. In Matthew 8, a leper comes to Jesus. And we are worried about our social distancing and getting used to staying distant from people. But in Jesus' time with leprosy, it was extreme social distancing. Um, they were not allowed near people. If you were a leper, you had to live apart from the community in a leper colony. You were required to wear a bell so that people could hear you coming. And if you saw anyone on the road where you were going to shout, unclean, so that they would be able to get out of the way and not get too close to you. But this leper dared to come and kneel in front of Jesus and to say, if you choose, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I do choose. And he not only spoke those words, but he reached out and he touched him when no one could or would touch him. And he said, be clean. And the man was made well. Now, as a young man, no doubt that man's life had been normal, ordered. And then the terrible disease came and there was extreme disorder. And then with the touch of Jesus, he was made well again, restored he could begin to reorder his life again. Now, not everyone who was alive when Jesus was, was healed. Only those he came in contact with. And Jesus never promised that God would heal everyone. But Jesus couldn't help himself when he saw people hurting. He had to help. And before Jesus left the earth, he told his followers that they were to go and teach and do what he had done. And no, we aren't the Son of God. We don't have the same capacity to heal as Jesus did. But God works through people, through doctors and nurses and researchers, through people who pray. Our task is to come alongside those that are broken, to stand with them, to care for them, to encourage them. We're all broken in some way. But during this time, some are feeling more broken than usual. People who are lonely, people who are scared, people who are dealing with financial hardship. We can offer hope and in a way healing by reaching out, by encouraging. Maybe it's as simple as sending a note to someone, letting them know that you care, encouraging them, incarnating the love and care of Jesus to someone who needs a reminder right now of God's love. Jesus was constantly looking for the broken, the needy, those that needed hope. And that's what we're to do in his name. When we do that, we start to bring order to disorder and give hope to the hopeless. This is what Jesus says to broken people. Again, come to me, all 
that are weary and heavy laden or carrying heavy burdens, I will give you rest. And then he sends people like us to others to bring rest, to bring comfort, to bring encouragement, to bring hope in his name. Jesus specializes in bringing something beautiful out of the scars of our lives. He specializes in bringing reorder to our disordered world. That's what Jesus does. The stained glass window in our image um, is one from the Church of the Resurrection. When the Church of the Resurrection is now a huge church and the last sanctuary that they built because they had outgrown the previous one, um, they decided to commission a stained glass window. Um, and it starts on one side and has the story of the garden and then depicts a lot of stories in the Bible ending with the tree of life um, pictured in Revelation. But they said that they wanted the center and the central message to be Jesus with his arms spread wide so that regardless of whether people were going by outside and saw the lit window at night or if they came into the sanctuary and that's the first thing you see, they would get that message that Jesus was there with his arms outstretched, that he gives us the invitation to come to me, all that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what Jesus promises us if we only will trust in him. We can choose. Is the future going to be the same or worse than the present? Or will we put our trust in Jesus, who came for people whose lives were disordered and reordered and put them back together again? In him is our hope. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that when we did not understand the depth of your love for us, you sent Jesus into the world to be an instrument of your love and grace, that he was unafraid to reach out and touch those who were hopeless, those that were seen as beyond the love and grace of God, and that he reached out and loved them and brought them close to God and reordered their lives once again. Help us to open our own lives to what Jesus offers us, to lay down our burdens and allow him to give us rest. And then help us to take Jesus' words seriously, that we are to go and do what he did and to love in his name. Send us into the world where there are people hurting to offer that same hope. Help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, that we might bring hope and peace and love to those around us. It is in his name we pray as we pray the prayer he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our hope is in the resurrected Christ. So go to hope nonetheless, hope despite, hope still. We go, praying God will strengthen us to hope where we have ceased to hope. Hope amid what threatens hope. Hope beyond what we have hoped. Holy Spirit, empower us with hope that defies expectations, hope that questions what we have known, hope that makes a way where there is none. We go to bear witness to the hope of Christ, hope that takes us past our fear, hope that calls us into life, hope that holds us beyond death. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.